Hello, good morning. I am at a place called Little Morton Hall, which is a very rare survival from the Tudor period. It's an absolutely fascinating half timbered house, which I've been dying to visit for years. And yeah, I'm desperate to get inside. So let me take you in. Little Morton Hall is arguably the finest half timbered Tudor manor in England and is located just southwest of Congleton in Cheshire. The earliest parts of the house were built by the prosperous Cheshire landowner William Morton in 1504 and was added to by future generations up until about 1610. The name Morton means a farm from the Old English word tun and at a marsh from the Old English word moor. So Morton means a farm on a marsh. But the family were more than farmers. They were influential landowners with an entrepreneurial streak. The Morton family roots can be traced back to the marriage of Lettuce de Morton and Sir Gralham de Lostock in 1216. The successive generations adopted the name of de Morton and through a series of marriages acquired quite a lot of lands and estates. The family also purchased lots of land cheaply after the Black Death epidemic in 1348, making them even more wealthy. The first room you come to as you pass over the moat and through the gatehouse is this room, which looks like a small stables, but in actual fact it was used as a corn store. In the inner courtyard you're met with the Great Hall, where you can't fail to notice the huge amount of glass windows, which was a way of displaying their wealth. And this house has over 30,000 individual panes of glass, so they definitely had quite a bit of money. Through this ancient door is the private chapel. This was built in the early 1500s and the chancel added in the mid 1500s. For a period of time, the family left Little Morton and the chapel fell into disrepair and was actually used as a storeroom for over 200 years. Thankfully, it was restored by Elizabeth Morton and was rededicated as a chapel in 1893. This room is one of the earliest surviving examples of a pre-Reformation domestic chapel in England. Religion was a central feature in daily life in Tudor England. Services in the chapel would have been attended by the entire household with the servants and labourers on the ground floor and the Morton family observing from the chamber above. The Great Parlour is part of the original H-shaped building from the first decade of the 1500s. In medieval times, masters and servants shared the same spaces for eating and sleeping, but from the 16th century, wealthy families started living more privately and separated their spaces from their servants. The Great Parlour was reserved for the family and their guests. This was the very beginning of the upstairs-downstairs divide that we all know so well from later times. A surprise electrician freed these wondrous paintings from their hiding place behind panelling in 1976. They were in a deteriorated state and it took three years to renovate them. The Tudors loved vivid colours around their houses. Pigments for creating bright coloured paints and dyes were very expensive, so it was another way of displaying their wealth. This is the oldest part of the house, the Great Hall, around which all the other buildings were added as the change in society moved away from communal living. Privacy along with the need for more space became important and so the family added new wings to the house. Timber frame buildings were essentially prefabricated. Carpenters cut the timbers and joints in their yards to make the frames. Then they transported them to the building site where a team of labourers winched and levered them into place. Lath and plaster fills the panels between the timbers. Laths which are thin strips of wood were covered with a plaster made from lime, sand and cow dung. The plaster is then coated with a lime wash, giving it an off-white finish. As frames for the hall were prefabricated, carpenters cut marks into the wood to show which timbers fitted where when reassembling, as seen here. Tudor carpenters also had a cunning way of making pegs fit tightly. They dried the pegs in front of a fire, making them shrink. Then, when tapped into the green wood of the timbers, they reabsorbed moisture, swelling to fit the hole. This meant that the pegs didn't even have to be perfectly round, sometimes they were even square. Ever heard of the saying, square peg round hole? This is where it comes from. This house also has 240 of these burn marks, 
which were made as part of a superstitious protective practice. Another superstitious practice was concealing shoes within the structure of the building to ward off spirits and to encourage the fertility of the female occupants. There have been 18 shoes found at Little Morton. Here is one of the houses to the loos, or toilets. The toilet lies directly over the moat for quick and easy disposal in the days before modern toilets. As wonky as this fireplace looks, it is actually perfectly straight, as tested with a spirit level. It is the room around it that is so distorted. On the top floor is the Elizabethan Long Gallery, a fashionable space for ladies to take exercise. Having a long gallery in one's house was the height of fashion in Elizabethan times. Lit by expensive candlelight during the evenings when the Mortons had company, the Long Gallery would have shone like a beacon across the dark countryside. The open space, the glass, the quatrefoil pattern in the rafters, all these demonstrate the Morton family's desire to impress. At the end of the Long Gallery are plasterwork depictions of destiny and fortune. The designs were copied from a book by Robert Record, and it is believed that the plasterer wasn't able to read. As you can see backward ends in several words, and the sphere of destiny should actually have been the sphere of destiny. Funnily enough, it is possibly the addition of the Long Gallery that has caused so much of the wonky appearance of Little Morton Hall. With no provisions having been made for the additional load, this would add to the ground floor and first floor structures below. Distortion is clearly visible on the ceilings of the floors below. The further new oak inserts, evident at the base of many external wall posts, where rotted posts had been repaired, but not before settlement had already taken place. These factors, plus natural movement and settlement of the frame, account for the distortion of this house. During the 1990s, to make the house structurally sound, the National Trust inserted metal pins and steel plates throughout the front wing of the house, as well as these steel plates underneath to support the floor beams in 2019. The house remained in the possession of the Morton family for almost 450 years, until ownership was transferred to the National Trust in 1938. It's such a fascinating survival and I could have stood admiring all the details for hours. I love this little bit of self-promotion above the bay window. Richard Dale is named as the head right and workman for the south range of the house in William Morton's will in 1563. A carpenter of his calibre would have acted as a businessman, producing designs and scale drawings, selecting timbers, hiring labour. And I like 
how he carved his name over the windows in the courtyard so everybody knows that this was his work. I've just noticed that from Little Morton Hall, you can see all the way up to Mocock Castle, which is just there, at the top of the hill. I might have to see if I can take you up there and give you a look. And there she is, Mocock Castle. Look at the state of me. <laughs> when I come through a hedge backwards. Anyway, back off to the car. The next morning, we got up for a sunrise walk around home. We're really lucky to have the beautiful Elveston Castle on our doorstep, which has some great grounds and even a nature reserve, which is where we wanted to head to this morning to see if we could spot any herons, who usually nest here. Are you sure we don't want your juicy nut, Mr. Squirrel? Then this one might, it's coming over the top. Do you want this juicy nut, Mr. Squirrel? Or Mrs. Squirrel? Let's see your nut, Heidi. My nut for the egg. <laughs> He's got the egg one. My nut for the squirrels. A little acorn? Yes. I have got a juicy, yummy acorn for you, squirrels. And whoever gets it first gets to eat it all for you. All. home, I thought I'd give you a little glimpse of what's still flowering in our garden at the moment. We've still got some roses, giving us the last flush of the year, plenty of dahlias in loads of different colours and varieties, some Japanese anemones, purple aster, even some begonias which are still unbelievably growing. There's some fuchsias and, of course, some autumn colour creeping in, alongside the last of our fruit and veg which we need to harvest. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode of our life this week. Please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss future videos. I hope you have a wonderful week. Lots of love.